Okay, good afternoon everybody um, and welcome to today's webinar which is all about the fundamental ideas of effective observation practice. Um, for those of you who joined us on the previous one, um, it's very much we're building on the information that we gave out last time about how you know we're going to be building on that by creating an observation culture that is positive and embedded in all you do, um, what are the fundamentals that we're looking for from an observation and how as an observer you can make it as effective as possible for your organization um, and again we'll be very much looking at you know that these are really good important things and important tools that you can use to add to your SAR and your quip um, so just before we start I'll have to have a think, okay okay oh. <laughs> Can we just possibly uh, just make sure that everyone that's on today, can we just make sure that your voice has been muted? Um, Sorry. There's pl no, <laughs> that's all right. Um, I know there is, you know, there's quite a few people on at the moment and that's absolutely brilliant to see. But just for the sake of the webinar, could we just ask for your voice is muted um, and then you can only hear myself and the colleagues speaking. Um, those that joined us last time, uh, you will have already downloaded the Kahoot quiz. Um, again, for those that are just joining us for the first time, um, please could I ask that you download that app now. It's literally, again, it's just literally for us to collect feedback on how you think this webinar has gone. Um, it doesn't require you to set up an account. It doesn't take any of your personal information. It's just literally, you. we will give you a PIN number to access the survey and you can give us the feedback back. Um, it's greatly appreciated to those that do it because it really helps us and make sure we pinpoint the exact requirements that you all have. Um, again, if you've got any questions, can we ask you to wait to the end of the webinar? And then if you, there will be an opportunity for you to type out any questions and myself and my colleagues will do our very best to answer them, answer as many as there are given to us. Um, just to remind you, for all of you who are attending this webinar, um, you will get a CPD certificate for attending, which those as trainers you can use towards your um, RTAS requirements. And those that don't need the RTAS requirements but will still be doing CPD, you can use this towards your in-house CPD hours. Um, we haven't yet been able to send out the certificates for the previous webinars. However, that should change in the next couple of weeks when our head office will be opening and therefore we'll be able to get the certificates out to all of you. And um, please don't worry, we haven't forgotten and we will get them out to you. Okay, so if we just have briefly look at the aims of these, this webinar. So today we are very much looking at how to affect how to have effective observation practices. Um, we're going to be looking at the different types of observations you could you could have in your organization um, and seeing how they will help you. Um, we're going to be spending quite a lot of time looking at what sort of things are you looking for in a good observation. So as an observer, what are you looking for from your trainers and what we are looking for from your trainers? And then also, you know, how your trainers can make sure that they do everything that has been requested. Um, and then lastly, we'll be touching upon how these effective observations will actually help your business in the long run. As you know, as I said in the previous webinar, all of this has to link to how it will help improve your business. And now I'm going to hand over to Angie, who's just going to remind us about the RTAS rules and how this applies to observations. Thanks, Sarah. So the content on observations was increased in 2018 version of the RTAS rules version 1 to reinforce the importance of observations. And it's detailed in the current RTAS rules version 1 in clauses 2.2.10 and 2.2.11. Briefly, I won't read the slide out word for word, but briefly they cover that trainer and assessors are required to do three observations over a 12 months period. And trainers and assessors are required to do four observations over a 12 months period over both training and assessing. If a trainer is a higher risk, uh, than low risk in the systematic risk activities that you do, more should be done to the level that the risk is controlled and that's obviously measured by each provider individually. 
Our task version 2, which was published just recently, rewords these same requirements and makes them more detailed. However, our task version 2 also contains a new requirement for sub-sponsored trainers and assessors. So where a trainer and assessor is sub-sponsored, that sub-sponsor training provider needs to do observations based on a percentage base of the delivery that they do for that provider and as a minimum one of each training and assessing is expected and the rationale behind the sample or the frequency of those observations is to be documented by the assured provider um, and the compliance quality assurance managers will be looking for that information when they come along to do your assurance visits. Now Sarah will talk through um, the skills of a good observer. Oh, thank you very much Angie. So I just wanted to briefly talk about you know what sort of skills do you need as if you are an observer and you are the observer for your organization um, not everybody you know it's not an easy thing to be a good observer and there are plenty of courses out there that you could do for CPD hours should you wish to to help um, further your skills within being a good observer but the most important things when looking at being a good observer is that you are looking and you are listening to everything that's going around about you in the classroom so this is not only listening to the trainer and what he or she is delivering but also listening to the responses that the learners are giving the trainer listening to whether or not the trainers are taking part whether they are listening carefully to what the trainer is giving, the information they're giving, uh, looking around the classroom, making sure that you, know, you haven't got learners who are actually not paying attention. Um, that, that is an indicator that they are not learning um, and therefore the trainer needs to be picking up on this. Um, you need to make sure it's critical, and this is, this is really critical when it comes to giving the grade out at the end, that you need to be able to record everything you see. This, so when it comes to giving the grade, whether good or bad at the end, you've got the evidence to back up the grade that you are giving. Often we are finding that when we're going to organisations, we're seeing that trainers have been marked as gold standard and they may well be gold standard. However, when you read the observation report, there isn't enough information in that report to show how they have become gold standard. And by recording everything that you see and do within the organization means that you will be able to see, you will be able to back up your justification for the grade. You need to make sure that you are objective as an observer. Even if you are going in to observe your best friend or a colleague that you've worked with for many years, you must make sure that you are objective and that you are grading them based on what you are seeing in that moment in time. It may well be that they are normally gold standard, but in this particular observation, something has occurred, which means they are not. You need to make sure that you are objective with the grading giving, because again, when we're coming out to ask, we are going to be asking those questions as to what was your rationale behind giving that trainer gold. Something that I think a lot of observers forget about is that you need to be able to reflect on what you've seen. It isn't necessary that you have to be able to give the grading out straight away. You may well need to think about what you've seen and decide and compare it to the quality framework matrix to determine which grading that you give. It's also a great idea to question the trainer. So before you have even decided on the grade, it's, if you are a good observer, you are questioning the trainer who will then be able to confirm or reject what you have seen or what the impression or the interpretation you have got. And the trainer can then work with you to come up with what actually did happen and their version of what they saw happening. So I want to just briefly talk to you about, so these are the different types of observations that can happen. Um, I briefly talked about learning walks last week. Um, 
But I think the majority of you who are on here are trainers and observers. And you fundamentally use the formal observations. So these are exactly the, what the RTAS requirements ask for. They're asking for graded um, observations that are usually quite long, so they're a good few hours long. They're well planned. Um, and that these are very much used in your performance management and your appraisal and your action plans. And that is absolutely brilliant and that is really good practice. But what I want to draw your attention to are learning walks, which are a great way of um, doing observations that shouldn't, that shouldn't be formal. These are very much informal observations and they can be completed by anyone. It doesn't have to be the observer. It could be different levels of management or even peers that are wanting to just get an understanding of what's going on in another classroom to theirs. Um, and these are, you know, especially with the leaders and managers who maybe don't go to do observations, this is a great way for them to get a true in the moment snapshot of training. Um, so they actually get to see firsthand what is going on and the really good practice that I'm sure is going on within each of your classrooms. And um, it'll also allow them to have an opportunity to speak to learners. You know, it's very much, this is not to be seen, these learning walks are not to be seen as a formal observation. It's very much a short period of time, 15, 20 minutes that you can go in you can just go and see what's going on and it's very much used as a support tool or a learning tool. You don't use this as a way of um, grading, you grading the trainers. It's very much a, a learning tool that you can all work together to help improve different aspects of your work. So I know I talked about this at the previous webinar and I just really want to reinforce this with you all um, is about making it a positive experience and that it is something that you are that you all are getting out of it. So as an observer, I think it's really important that you let your trainers know that you are you're genuinely interested in about about the learning that's taking place and the learners within your classroom. It's not about tripping the trainer up. It's literally going to see what learning is taking place. You need to make sure that the trainers know that you're actually there fundamentally, you are doing these observations to help develop their delivery, that this is not a blame culture, and it's very much of you know, working with you to improve what you already do. Trainers need to feel valued. When you are doing feedback, you must make sure that you really go through the positives of what you've experienced because I'm sure that the majority of trainers within these org your organizations are of a great standard and it's really important that you make sure that they feel valued and that you know what their worth is. It's important that observations are completed because they find out not only about the good experiences that's taking place in the classroom, but also the experiences learners are having. And just reinforce this with your trainers that one of the things you know we're looking for when we come out to see you is what feedback learners have given you. And if you are able to ask questions during observations, it's another tool and another piece of evidence you can show us. It's really important, again, stay to find positive and inspiring things to share. Say to the trainer that you're going to see what good practice you're doing and it's so that you can then share it with others within your organisation. You just need to make sure that at all times it's seen as a positive experience as possible. So prior to the observation, now I'm not saying this needs to be weeks in advance, but if it's a planned observation, you need to be able to provide the trainer with a time frame for this observation. Whether this is um, you're telling your trainer that you're going to be coming in in this session or that you can give them um, a period of time of when you would expect to have an observation done, say, for instance, a certain week or a certain month in the calendar. But make sure that the trainer knows about the time frame for these observations. Also, give clear parameters of what you're looking for. 
it might be that you're just going to do a general observation and therefore you'll be using the quality assurance um, matrix that we use when we come to complete observations. But it also might be that you are going to specifically look at what was on their on the trainers previous action plans to see whether they have developed those points and allowing you to sign off the action plans. It might also be that you've decided that as an organization you have highlighted certain areas that you wish to develop and it could be areas on the quip that you are using as what you're going to watch deliver in that observation. But just make sure that you explain to the trainer what your expectations are. Now, what sort of paperwork do you potentially need to be looking at? So this is not that you have to do it. This is just an example of good practice. So good practice is that the trainer will have ready for the observation or the lesson. They will have to hand their progress report that they have to fill in, their training plan that they will have of the full qualification that they're delivering, and then potentially any additional health and safety plans that you may have depending on the qualification that you are delivering. I think good practice is to almost have them on the desk ready before the observation. So should, or not, should you as an observer want to, you can ask the trainer to have a look at these things. This is just what good practice looks like and it's up to you as an organisation how you, um, what sort of things that you ask for. So as an observer, what would you expect to see during the, the observation? So what are you expecting your tr the observation to show? So we need to see that the learners are all engaged. You know, are the learners asking the relevant questions? Do they look like they are listening to what is going on around them? Or are they too busy looking at things on their phones? If, if learning is taking place, then learners will be engaged. And this is one of the things you really need to look at during an observation. As an observer, you know, it's very much the good practice is the trainer is organized and all the relevant information, all the relevant resources are already in the classroom. As an observer, we don't want to be seeing learn. Uh, trainers going in and out of the classroom because they're not properly prepared. So you need to make sure that all the relevant resources are in place. You need to make sure that the training plan is being followed or at least the progress record is being followed so that the key areas are being taught. And making sure that the trainer is showing the really high levels of knowledge that is required to teach these courses. A way of seeing this is, you know, is the trainer giving the learners scenarios and stories about his or her time on the railway to help, to help the learners identify with the knowledge that's being taught and how it would be put in practice in the real world. As an observer, we need to be seeing what sort of questioning is the trainer giving to the learners? Is there good opening que open questionings that require different answers and not just yes or no answers? You know, are they allowing for opportunities, for questions to develop into further discussion around the classroom and then therefore um, engaging all the learners within the classroom? With these courses, you always have a multitude of levels of people attending your courses. So are you stretching and challenging the learners? So for instance, those learners that maybe are on a PTS course and it's their fifth time on doing a PTS course. What we need to be seeing as an observer is that not only are they, um, not only are they re-engaging with the information that they've already learned, but are they learning anything extra? Have they been stretched and challenged to the best of their ability? And as an observer, you will see this within the additional resources perhaps given to them, with the questioning that the trainer is giving, but also when you talk to the learners for feedback, they'll be able to give you examples of when they feel that they have been stretched and challenged. We've already discussed about learning taking place when we talked about learners being engaged. And, you know, this is fundamental in an observation. We have to see that learning is taking place. 
Also, are a variety of different learning styles being used? So, for instance, you know, those learners that, that are in, you have in the classroom that are visual learners, is the trainer using posters and pictures to help develop the learning of these types of learners? If you have auditory learners, have, has the trainer given opportunities for the PowerPoint and reading off papers because that's how best they learn from reading things? And then, of course, we've got the kinesthetic learners. These are the learners that need to be getting up and moving about. They need very much interactive lessons. You know, are they being able to use, do scenario planning with some of the resources in the room? Are they allowed to mix around the room with other learners? You know, I do completely understand that at the moment, given the COVID-19 going on, we understand as observers that this is not always possible at the moment. But where it is possible, has that taken place? Which, again, then this links very nicely to are the lessons and tasks interactive? So have the, has a trainer used every opportunity to make the lesson and the task interactive? Has it been that the trainer is not just standing for three hours at the front of the classroom talking? Has he, has he or she looked at ways that they can involve all the learners in the learning? And then also we've just got information and guidance. Has there been an opportunity where the trainer could impart knowledge on information guidance and next steps in their career? These are all things that you will find on the quality assurance matrix of when you are looking at doing an observation and grading the delivery that is in front of you. So I'd like to talk to you now about training plans and personalised learning. And this is very much aimed at not only the observer, but also the trainers that are delivering these courses. Um, and I'm going to show you an example of how we would expect to see it as an observer. So we completely understand that in the real world, you are at times trainers are um, given a, 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 a group of learners and they haven't had time to properly understand um, the different backgrounds of the learners in front of them. However, we still good practice is to show that you have still done some sort of personalized learning. And I know that trainers are already doing this within their, within their delivery. However, as observers, we need to make sure that it's properly recorded because a lot of trainers don't realize they're even doing it. And as observers, we need to show that this is what good practice and gold standard is all about. So in your training plan or your progress report, there should be somewhere some clearly defined learning objectives. So there needs to be somewhere that shows what is the point of what they're learning and what will the learners learn as a result of this qualification. We need to see, again, going back to what I previously said, if you've got learners on your course that have done it five times, how are you personalising the learners for them? So how are the trainers stretching and challenging those learners? And good practice is that we see that in the process record progress records. We need to make sure as observers that we are seeing trainers look at ways to embed the English and maths. Whether this is signposting the learners to um, their local colleges or further education establishments that offer additional courses in English and maths or it's simply about ways of embedding it into the qualification and the training. Some really good ways of doing it is getting, is seeing trainers, getting the learners to ask the questions because this is developing their reading and speaking skills. Are you allowing for group work where they're improving their speaking and listening skills? In regards maths, are you using, are the trainers using every opportunity to embed maths? So for instance, a really good stretch and challenge question could be for those that have done PTS courses before or um, have done other training courses before and looking at for instance um, you've got in the hazard directory it shows distance in miles and yards but the sectional appendix is shown in miles and chains so sometimes so why not get the learners to do a conversion of this 
so for instance, ask them, well, if 22 yards is one chain, what would 440 yards be? What would 880 yards be? And this is another great way of just not only embedding the maths into the lessons you're delivering, but also stretching and challenging those learners. And again, we need to see this in your personalized learning and your progress records. Again, good practice is that you've got your interactive lessons. And again, this is recorded in your progress records that the assessment opportunities that you are doing are not only, they're not literally test assessments, are you being able to do some different types of assessments, some more practical assessments, and making sure that these are recorded in your progress records. Again, you know, I am sure that observers are seeing trainers do this day in, day out. It's just about recording it properly. And for those observers that are wanting their trainers to have gold standards, these are what we are looking for. So the lastly, so one of the most important things is, as an observer, we always see trainers that have got learners that have got additional needs in their class. So how are they being supported? So for instance, you know, if you've got learner that struggles with their reading, how are you helping them? And not only how are you helping them but ha write it down in your progress record we're not expecting you to write loads just literally scribble on your progress record of how you've had to adapt one of the assessments or one of the um, key objectives for those learners that need additional support and then and very lastly on the, tr the training plan we expect to see that the logical steps in learning are there are you building on throughout the day or throughout the course? Are you building on the prior knowledge that learner has received? And it's not about um, going into the really hard learning first, making sure that you've got the fundamental steps there before you progress. So this is a progress record that as observers, we see on a daily basis that trainers are filling in. Um, and we've put this on just to show you exactly how we would, how good practice as an observer, we would expect to see progress records. So for those trainers that you're wanting to say are gold standard, they need to be showing that they have personalized the learning for those with additional needs in their class. So on this progress record, we've, we've looked at the, uh, a learner that struggles with reading. Okay, but it could be that you've had to ad adapt some of the course because you've got some really intelligent people in your course that have done this course many times and need the stretch and challenge. It's up to you. It depends on what you have in front of you as to what you need to write in the progress record. But, so what we've done here is we've just shown that so, for instance, at the very beginning, you've got your introduction verification. You've got a learner that has additional needs. And so literally all you've written down next to the introduction and verification is one learner with additional needs and a scribe has been required to complete test. Another great example um, that we've seen many times as an observer is for the emergency phone call. You know, rather than giving the learner the written scenario that they're going to really struggle to read, um, Draw as a get the, tra the trainer should be drawing it out on a whiteboard so it's a visual picture for that learner, and therefore the learner can still pass the assessment because they've had it drawn out for them rather than written. It's we want to see in good observations, we want to see this as very much a working document. We don't expect lots of things to be typed upon it. All we expect is little scribbles to show how you've ad adapted things to suit the learners within your class. And this is the sort of thing we're looking for when we are looking at gold standard. You know, not only the stretch and challenge, but also how you've supported those additional needs. And as observers, you know, this is a brilliant way of building up a record of how you as an organization has helped individualized learning for learners and that when we are coming out to do assurance visits or other organizations are and we ask you well how have you personalized the learning for the learners within your organization you can show us these progress records and show us exactly how you have adapted the learning 
for specific learners. Um, if you've got any more questions on that, please feel free to ask us at the end of the session. So for those of you who took part in the previous webinar, you will have already seen this cycle, and I can't reinforce it enough with, um, with all of you that we talked very much yes last time about having a good quality observation culture and a robust observation culture but how this all leads to the better quality of training and the better observations that are completed which then will fundamentally lead to much better learner feedback um, because they will be happy with the quality of training that has been provided for them which again links very nicely to the higher levels of potential grading you will get from potentially from ourselves or from other organizations and if you've got learners going out there saying what a brilliant training provider that you are and you've also got good grading from other external agencies this can only then lead to an increase in business potential for you all as an organization and it shouldn't matter what position you are within within your organization but you should all be looking towards the same goals and the more business there is and the better level of quality there is can only have a positive impact throughout everything that you do. So just briefly, we'll look back at the aims of the webinar. So we've just talked about the effective observation practices, and this is talking about the learning walks and then the formal observations and what our tasks ask of you. Uh, we've also discussed what are we looking for in an observation. So we've looked very much of, as an observer, what sort of things are we looking for when we go out? And then also, what do we expect from the trainers? So hopefully there we've been able to answer. Those of you who are observers that are on this webinar, you can see the sort of things we would expect you to be looking out for. But also if you're a trainer, you've been able to see exactly what observers should be looking for and how you can reach that goal standard and be able to show good practice. And then lastly, we've talked about um, how these observations really help your business, which again, you should all be wanting your business to do well because it can only then increase things for yourselves. So um, before we go on to the Kahoot quiz and questions, I'd just like to bring your attention again to the webinars that are still to come. Um, uh, we have the next, the next. although we are delivering another one of this uh, fundamental observation, we're going to be doing next week. But after that, we have got on the 14th and the 21st of September, um, we have got the new RTAS rules and the changes and how the implications of this on your organisation. And then we're really lucky that on the 24th of September, we've got Ian Capewell from the Rail Accident Investigation Board, who's going to give it, who's going to give us a webinar and an introduction to what they do, which I think will be a brilliant way of giving you an insight into what they do. Um, the other webinars that we will have are written here. We've got um, we'll be looking at observation feedback and action plans. So as a result of completing these observations, what is a good practice to do afterwards? You know, making sure the feedback is relevant and achievable and making sure that the action plans are put in place are also achievable. We're going to be looking at very much the how do we foster good practice and talent whilst at the same time looking at how do we support those trainers that are underperforming to the standards you would expect. <coughs> We're also going to be looking again at the holistic learner and looking at how we treat the whole learner. And this links to some of the things I've just been talking about, where we're going to be looking at, you know, how can you help um, learners develop their English and maths? How can you help them with information and guidance? Um, how can you support the whole learner? Um, we've also got a webinar based on bias and unbiased delivery. And this links to what I was saying that as an observer, you must always be unbiased about the grading that you give and how can you make sure that you do that. We've talked about the introduction to the Rail Accident Investigation Board. We've got, uh, we've got webinars on standardisation and moderation. So those of you who are doing standardisation meetings and moderation activities, this is a webinar what good practice looks like um, and how you can embed it into all you do. We've also got smart targets, 
So how can you set achievable targets for your people in your organization? Um, we've also got, we've talked about the RTAS rules, which will be in a couple of weeks' time. And then lastly, we've got one on CPD ideas. And basically, the CPD, how you can record and upload them to ourselves and making sure you put the right uh, CPD in the right sections. Right, could we ask that you just do this Kahoot quiz? And I think I can see we've already got a few questions up there. So after the Kahoot quiz, we'll go through some of the questions. And if you've got any more, then please feel free to add them. So if I can ask you to all just turn on your Kahoot app now. And Tracy is very kindly going to give us the pin that we need to use to enter. Okay, bear with me. And pin is four zero four five three six nine and I'll do that again for you that's four zero four five three six nine brilliant thank you Tracy and um, it'll ask you to put a nickname in if you want to put your name in great if not you can put in a nickname um, if you don't want to be known that's absolutely fine once you've done that, it should say that you're in um, and you, you're ready to go. So, we're just getting ready on the Kahoot. So you've got your first question. The same as last time, the joining instructions were clear and simple to understand. So please press red if you strongly agree, blue if you agree, yellow if you disagree, and green if you strongly disagree. So that is the joining instructions were clear and simple to understand. We really appreciate everybody doing this as it really does help us analyse what we're doing well and what we could look to improve at. So question two, the aims and objectives of the webinar with clear, red for strongly agree, blue for agree, yellow for disagree, and green for strongly disagree. So that's red for strongly agree, blue for agree, yellow for disagree, and green for strongly disagree. So question three now, the aims of the objectives of the webinar were met. Please press red if you strongly agree, blue if you agree, yellow if you disagree, or green if you strongly disagree. So that's red if you strongly agree, blue if you agree, yellow if you disagree, and green if you strongly disagree. So we're halfway through now, just three more questions. Question four. So the presenters had a good understanding of the subject. Red, if you strongly agree. Blue, if you agree. Yellow, if you disagree. Or green, if you strongly disagree. So the presenters had a good understanding of the subject. Then we've just got two more questions to go and then we can move on to questions from yourselves. So question five, the webinar was well presented and led in an appropriate style. Red if you strongly agree, blue if you agree, yellow if you disagree, and green if you strongly disagree. So the webinar was well presented, led in an appropriate style. And then we're just going to move on to the very last question. Thank you again for everyone taking part. So question six is, the information from this webinar will help put new processes in place at work. So this is very much, have you come away from this webinar having learned something and it will impact what you do at work. So red if you strongly agree, blue if you agree, yellow if you disagree, and green if you strongly agree. 
So that was red for strongly agree, blue for agree, yellow for disagree, or green for strongly disagree. Okay, that's brilliant. Thank you so much for everyone taking part. We do really appreciate it. You know, for just so you know, for those of you who like what you've seen on the Kahoot, this is something that as an organization, you could look at putting into practice within your delivery, um, as it is a brilliant way to not only get feedback, but it also does help. You can set up really good interactive quizzes to really, as trainers, test the learners as a recapping or a summary to see if they've actually learned anything from the delivery. Oh, okay, so we're gonna do any questions. Um, I think, um, I think Sarah, the only one that uh, Angie's already answered was, um, will the uh, slides or, and or video be available, which is yes. Yeah, we will do our very best to get the uh, slides out to you so you can use that. Um, thank you for those who are saying that you've struggled with the Kahoot app, but that thank you for trying. Um, like I say I understand that if, if you've not used Kahoot for before, it doesn't always, it takes a bit of getting used to. Sarah, so I've, um, I've got a question or, and a okay. kind of observation and proposal at the same time, really. When you're looking okay. at the, the, you give us some advice on observations about learner interaction, equality, diversity. And, and other things that have got to be evaluated. But my observation is we're using training material that's over 25 years old. So for those that are around on this webinar that helped develop the original stuff, that was 21 years ago, everybody. And if other than the cost virtual reality, we're still using the same kind of format and the same kind of process that when I was training 25 years ago. So it's pretty much the same material with the same style. So I was just wondering whether you guys could give maybe Network Rail some help in relation to what you're lo looking for in relation to learner interaction. And, and things have moved on in 25, 30 years. But we're stuck with stuff that we've all kicked around now for tw 25 plus years. And other than it being in PowerPoint, for those that remember it before, it was acetate. And I, I, I don't see any advancement in making sure that is that level of learning inter learner interaction because the material doesn't lend itself to it and um, yeah i totally i totally understand um exactly where you're coming from um and i think and, and i do understand that you know like I say these things are so old with things um i think it's just very important that yes maybe these training plans haven't moved on um, but that the rtas requirements have um, and that the rtas requirements do ask for you to look at the different things that you are doing with your learners and you know as a trainer almost using you know your own personalized way of doing things of how do you think you can embed these additional things um, in regards to what we can feed back um, i might hand over to tracy to see uh, what her thoughts are on that one. Thanks, Sarah. Um, we can take your uh, comments, Steve, absolutely, and um, uh, share them with Network Rail. Um, there's a couple um, of people on the call already um, that can hear you uh, from Network Rail, so um, absolutely we're, um, we'll take them forward for you. If you've got any suggestions of um, how you think they should be delivered or anything that you want to trial with their, with their blessing, then uh, please say so. Uh, yeah, I'll give them my rates as well, Tracy. Sorry, say again. I'll give them you give them your rates. Oh. <laughs> I thought you said that. I was just checking. <laughs> um, just but no, that I believe ones. we've got a question uh, already with um, uh, the the email, the TQAS, and they they are searching for us. They've got um, a, a query in and around uh, virtual learning, Steve. So as soon as mm. we've got an answer to that, um, it's it, it's not gone unnoticed, and they uh, they will respond as soon as they can. Yeah, um, just another, just a couple of observations, really, and it's probably questions for the RTAS webinars and in relation to the number of observations, because obviously COVID nineteen will have an impact on people, because you know in reality, you know Network Rail extended everybody's competencies, and everybody stopped training and assessment for the good part of four, between four and six months. So I, I would think that's obviously got to be considered. 
Uh, and the other one with the new rule, with the, the sharing out of these observations, I think that's a good move. But I think it's also important that, I mean, we don't sub-sponsor many trainers anyway, but there's got to be that kind of interactivity between whoever that trainer works for, because they could be observed by one organisation, but then only keep that information within the organisation. Because if, if one of my trainers was working for somebody else and they'd been observed, good, bad or indifferent, I'd, I'd like to see that, that those actions and observations. So I don't know what facility there is to, other than contacting each other, but I'm not sure that that will happen. But I think it's a good idea. Yeah, no, it, and it's something, Steve, that came out of the um, the assurance visits uh, where one company, exactly what you say, they could be getting gold, gold, gold from one company. Mm. They come to you or to where uh, anyone else and then you think, well, how on earth did you get gold? It might just mm. be a bad day. It might be pressure and you, you can help them. But um, certainly um, you get a good feeling or a bad feeling from for whatever you see. Mm. Um and we encouraged everybody on the last uh, webinar to upload their observations onto Skills Backbone uh, and then you can see them. Mm. So, so then you can see what grades they've got, any actions they've got. You can support that. You can create your own, wh whichever way around, but it's, it is there for you to see. Yeah. yeah, and I think someone's asked us there, haven't they? Yeah, you must make sure your observations are uploaded onto Skills Backbone. Yeah. Um, and I can see that also there's somebody else, Tom, that has said um, a similar to what you were saying Steve about um, the fact that uh, the course delivery needs to be tailored to each group now what I'd just like to just expand on that slightly in that yes the training plans are generic you know there's no getting away from that but we have seen you know us as observers when we've been going out we've seen courses delivered in so many different ways and it's down to the trainer's strengths of how they feel best to deliver. So it is personalized to the trainer in that sense. And then also, um, you know, as a trainer, you need to tailor the course to what you have in your group. So if you do have, you might have a class full of learners that have done the course 10 times over. And therefore, you know, you are, you know, you can decide how to best meet their needs. So as long as you get those fundamentals, those key areas covered, you can adapt things based on what group you've got in front of you. Um, I hope that helps to the person that asked that question. I, I just draw everybody's attention to the very first page of every training plan. And it says, this is the minimum content. Minimum. Yeah. And Absolutely. I think Sarah covered that. It doesn't, that doesn't mean yeah. to say you, as long as it's technically and factually correct, you can't add, add content or add whatever you want to it. But, you know, it's a sad indictment that a lot of the trainers will only train to the minimum content. But yeah. it's, in, it's, in, it's always been there on the, on the front page. Yeah, and that's why we're doing these webinars, just to show them that, yes, we under, yeah, there is the minimum requirement. But if you are wanting, um, you know, if you are wanting high grading, um, you know, you need to be doing more than that minimum requirement. Yeah. As a trainer, you know, you'd like to think that this is a vocation that you've chosen and that as a trainer, you're very much wanting to um, really help the learners in front of you and you want to engage the learners and, you know, you need to be able to tailor these things to how best to meet the needs of the learners and the minimum requirement won't do that. Um, so, yeah, that is important. Um, I think then we've got another question. Um does the sorry, level Sarah. I'm sorry, Sarah, I didn't mean to cut over you there, but there is one that um, Derek's asked about observations uploaded to Skills Backbone. It looks like that you're not sure as to whether you can upload observations into Skills Backbone, um, but there is a facility there. Um, it's on the left-hand side um, of your Skills Backbone pages. There is an observations page there, um, and that's where you can upload your documents and assign who it was that um, observed the individual um, and on what date they were observed. And that's my, that's my bad there. I, I typed that incorrectly. What I was trying to get across was that that would be a perfect way for us if we did sponsor and sub-sponsor trainers between organisations to be able to see one another's observations through that one platform. It's certainly something we can take away to have a look to see if the software can help you do that. Um, there are obviously GDPR 
issues within that to be able to see each other's data um, that I need to take away and understand better. But if that's something that the majority of the industry wants, then of course we can take it forward and see if it's a possibility to achieve it in skills backbone or not. But I will take that forward in terms of a possible future enhancement um, if uh, the, the software and GDPR issues allow us to do that. Oh, Thank you. That's brilliant. Thank you, Angie. Um, we've just got one more question about the level three qualification for uh, trainers that need um, that you need the level three qualification. And they're just saying that does that qualification hold the relevant skills to develop the training package to ensure that it's more stimulating? Um, it, the level three qualification, you know, it is, it is only a short qualification. I understand that. Um, but ha having taught the level three qualification myself, um, I'd like to think that you are given the relevant skills that you need to be able to develop, develop the training package because, uh, you know, even you've got a lot of trainers and teachers that will just do this level three qualification and teach within colleges. And you are expected as a result of this qualification to be able to um, develop the training packages or the schemes of work that they have in hand. Um, however, I do take on board what you're saying in that, given it's such a short course, you know, maybe there's more training that we could do around helping you um, look at the relevant skills that you would need to help develop your training skills um, and maybe doing some webinars or some workshops on how can you um, develop what the training plan you've got in front of it to make it more stimulating um, for your learners is, is definitely something that we could take away on and maybe have a look at how we could help support you with that. Um, have we, hopefully I've answered that question okay. Um, if you've got any, has anyone got any more questions? There is, um, um, there's one question from, or not a question, it's a request from Alex uh, from Network Rail, just wants to, uh, a very brief question, um, over a brief minute. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Tracy. Um, could you please continue to submit your questions for the RTAS webinar to the TQAS mailbox for me, please? Um, had some good questions so far, but Steve's obviously raised a few that would be would be good to put forward to the RTAS specific webinar. So please, everyone, if there is anything else you'd like answering, just please put it forward to the TQAS mailbox. And just to say, we are listening, so we, we are going to take the points that you've mentioned today forward. But any other suggestions, please yeah, continue to submit them to NSAB. If there is anything else you'd like the Network Rail to listen to, please, the TQAS mailbox is a good generic mailbox for us to pick anything up. So um, look forward to receiving some more questions and speaking to you all next week. Thanks, Tracy. Okay, no problem. There's just one more question there and then Sarah. Um, yes. from Andrew Gettins. Yes, yeah, so um, so yeah, you're saying that the engagement of learners, stretching learners, everything that you agree with, um, how does the PTS e-learning provide this? Um, good trainers should be able to utilise a variety of learning delivery skills, but e-learning does not cater for this. Um, I think, you know, I can, we can definitely say take away what you're saying there. I think the, you know, the e-learning is almost... Um, you know, it's the entry point, isn't it? It's the, to make sure that you have got the information required to complete the course, and then you can use the PTS day as a way of um, gaining knowledge into different areas, looking at how the e-learning is put into place in the real world. Um, but I agree, you know, learners aren't, not all learners are computer literate, and that's where you as an organization need to be able to support the learner and making sure that you can help them and it isn't a barrier to entry for them. Um, because whether we like it or not, you know, all learners, we're all in a, we're all in a world where we use computers now and it is a skill that, you know, most of us need to have. Um, but I agree that, you know, it is the e-learning at the moment is just aimed at one level. Um, and then it's down to the, the trainers to look at ways you can stretch and challenge what they've learned in that e-learning and also ways that you can support the learners. Um, but I definitely take away what you're saying and I will uh, report back on it. Okay. Um, have we got any more questions? Uh, or... so, sorry, could I, just, uh, could I just add to that, Sarah? Yeah, of course. Um, okay, um, just a quick example here. Um, e-learning um, can be done from um, 
<clears throat> any kind of um, environments, if you like. Um, that can do it from home or anywhere they've got an internet connection. However, whilst doing that e-learning, if there's something on that e-learning that they don't grasp, they don't understand, they don't have anyone to turn to at that particular time. Um, that, that's just a point I'd like yeah. to add. Yeah, and I, I do take that on board. And actually, um, it's been interesting for us as um, going out to visit different providers because different providers actually do the e-learning differently. So um, some of them, like, like you say, the e-learning is done at home and it's for them to do and it's down to the learner to do that. Um, but then we do have some providers that get the learners in the day before and they do the e-learning themselves, but there is the potential of a trainer or someone there that can help them if they don't understand um, what the e-learning is saying. So I think that's maybe looking at how you as an organisation can help support. Um, because you're right, especially these newcomers coming to it, you know, the e-learning you know, can be difficult for them. Um, so it's just you know, being able to adapt how you work as a training provider as to how to best meet those needs. Uh, yeah, so, so the, 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 the only snag with that is uh, obviously some learners who are applying for PTS it's not mandatory for them to attend a training provider for the e-learning. We do, yeah. as a training organisation, actually supply that, and we do provide it. However, because it's not mandatory, you could have learners turning up for a PTS, and you've had no involvement whatsoever with their e-learning, apart from to, 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 to verify that it's been completed. If I can jump in there, Sarah, if that's okay. Um, I think I think everybody gets that, Andrew. Um, in as far as um, the e-learning is is what it is, um, and it's purely there just for that, like you say, the very uh, early entry. Um, the sparkle happens, for want of a better phrase, is once you get hold of them, how you how you uh, interact with them, how you stretch and challenge them. So, you know, do your thing in the classroom and um, it will make a whole big difference for them. Thank you. Okay. All okay. right. We are just a couple of minutes short of uh, five o'clock. So thank you, everybody, for joining. Andrew, thank you for your, uh, for your questions at the end there. And, and Steve and Alex for, for, uh, for bobbing in and um, uh, for about the uh, where to send your questions to. If you need uh, that email address, uh, for the TQAS mailbox, um, Angie, I wonder if you just put it um, on the uh, on the ch the group chat there, um, so that everybody's got it as a uh, as a reference point. Um, but thank you once again, and wholeheartedly thank you to Sarah and to Angie for um, doing their bit. And as as Derek quite rightly said, um, I only pipe in and just give you six numbers, um, uh, so my part is very small. But um, thank you everybody for joining in. It, it's been a, a great experience. Yeah, thank you very much to everyone. And also thank you to Tracy, who actually does an awful lot behind the scenes for these webinars. No problem. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.